Take your Bibles with me and turn to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. At some point in time, I'm going to write another introduction. <laughs> People are going to get their bubble busted. I, it amazes me the last two Sundays I've preached. Two Sundays ago, I preached 26 minutes, and last Sunday, I preached 32 minutes. That's, that 26-minute one is the shortest message I think I've preached since I've been your pastor. <laughs> but uh, I, yeah, I, I, they, they, there's just such an a easy transition in, in these particular chapters, and the subject is so clear. And you know, one of the things that, that I noticed this week in studying this uh, I, I'm convinced. Yeah, you do realize that this that that the original transcript did not have chapters and verses in it, right? You do know it's a letter, and I I'm convinced based on what I see here and the chain of thought. You know, it it, it didn't stop at verse 29 and then him pick up the pen and write a different letter. This is one continual letter. And I think that the translators, by putting in these verses, they're good for us to know, but we need to disregard that it's a a different thought that's coming in here. It's It's a continuation of what he has previously talked about in the section that we just finished in chapter 3. And what he had explained to them and what he had illustrated... Uh, He had shown to them the difference that exists between us and these ancient people of Israel, national Israel, who were under the law, and he's made it clear that both the believing Jew and the unbelieving Jew that was in national Israel throughout this entire covenant, this covenant of, of Moses, they were under the law as a schoolmaster or a tutor. He says this, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith that should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Now keep in mind, he's got to be talking to these Jews because what he said in the book of Ephesians, the Gentiles by nature were without the law. They were not under the law. Now, the Lord did write a law in their hearts, according to Romans chapter 1 and 2, so that they knew and they can discern good and evil. But the Gentiles were without the law. They were out the promises. They were without the priesthood. They were without God, without hope in this world. But they were not under this Mosaic covenant. Now, we know there were some Gentiles that were proselyted in or became Judaistic and followed the Judaistic faith. But then when they were involved in it, what were they? They were under those same rules and regulations that were set up by that Mosaic law. He says, wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. And this is where we, we, we're, what's so important to what we're going to talk about this morning. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. He's saying, us Jews, these Judaizers who are there now demanding that these Gentiles abide by law. He's saying, me and them, all of us. Because that's the same way he addressed Peter in chapter 2. Peter, you and I who are Jews by nature, not like these Gentiles. Even we ourselves, what did we do? We believed in Christ that we might be justified by faith, not by the works of the law. So he's dealing with these Jews that are coming in and seeking to subvert and draw away these Gentile believers. And that's exactly what Paul has established by the words that we left off with last week. He said this, for you are all children of God. Who? These Gentiles who had not the law and were not under the law. And you Jews who were under the law, and under it as a schoolmaster, under it as a tutor, until the time, as we're going to see this morning, appointed by the Father. He says, for you are all children of God by faith. Where? In Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ and put on Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. You see that? All nationalities go away. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. 
For you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you be Christ, you know, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. These Jews, these Judaizers, were, who were troubling these Gentile believers, were seeking to put them back under the law. They were seeking to get them to obey something which they themselves had not obeyed perfectly. Our Lord said this, or Paul, Paul Peter said this, concerning these events that we see transpiring here in this letter that Paul's dealing with. In Acts 15, 10, he says, Now therefore why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we ourselves are able to bear? I always think of one statement that he makes in the book of Galatians. You that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Do you not hear what it demands? You think about it. Even if somehow these Judaizers could have obeyed it perfectly, which they couldn't, neither could you or I, they still couldn't be justified by it. But not only that, we go further than that. Nor could those that they were encouraging to follow their instructions to be under the law, they couldn't be justified by that law either. Paul stood up and he said this, Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that by this man is preached unto you, and this is what implicates us before the law. What's preached to us? The forgiveness of sins. No law, no sins. So the law, broken, shows us what? We're sinners. And by him, all who believe are justified, declared righteous from all things from which you could not be declared righteous. You could not be justified by the law of Moses. And that's Paul's point where we want to pick up this morning in verse 1 and 2. Now I say, Galatians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Now look up here. The heir that he speaks of here, now the heir. The heir here, Spoken of in this verse is the same ones that he talked about in the previous verses that are heirs according to the promise. Same heir. And that's so important. In the context of this chapter, particularly in light of the allegory that he's going to use, I can't wait to get to the allegory that he uses at the end of this chapter concerning national Israel as opposed to the Gentiles. Paul is not speaking about individuals here. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the church collectively. Particularly what? The Israel of God. God's chosen and redeemed elect who were part of national Israel throughout that entire Mosaic economy. That's who he's talking about. Paul had previous compared, previously compared the law to two things. What did he compare it to? First of all, he had compared it to a prison. It locks you up, points out your failures, and demands satisfaction. But then secondly, he had compared it to a tutor, a guide, an instructor. Remember what we said a tutor was? A tutor was somebody that watched over young, immature children until they reached full age to be able to comprehend and understand. In these verses in the, that we're looking at this morning, he brings another comparison before us, namely the relation a person who's under age or who's a minor, their relation to what? To the tutor, to the instructor, which is the law. Like one of old commentators, I read so many commentators, I think this was Gill wrote, I mean, no, I wasn't Gill. John Calvin wrote this. It shocked me that John Calvin wrote this. He said, the young man... Though he is free, though he is lord of all his father's family, 
still resembles a slave. For he's under the government of the tutors. The government being what? The law. The mosaic economy. But the period of the guardianship lasts only until the time appointed by the father. After which he enjoys his entire freedom. And I underline this in what he said. Now, in this respect, the fathers under the Old Testament, being the sons of God, were free. Abraham was free. Moses was free. Joshua was free. Right? They were free. King David was free. But they were, kept, were not in possession of freedom. They're free, but think about it, free but not free. While the law held the place of their tutor and kept them under its yoke. Why? Why'd God do that with those people? He kept them distinct from every other people for a long time until the promised seed would come. But he goes on. He said that slavery of the law lasted as long as it pleased God who put an end to it when? At the coming of Christ. Then he said this, lawyers enumerate various methods by which the tutelage or guardianship is brought to a close. But of all these methods, the only one adapted to this comparison is that, that which Paul has selected. What ends the tutorship? The appointed time of the Father. That's what's so important. See, that's what I want to know. When, when, did, when did he bring it to a close? When did he end? I tell you, I can give you a good illustration of when it was ended. When Christ cried, it's finished, what happened? The veil ran in two. Why? That way was done. And like I have said throughout this entire study, like I have said as we've been going through the book of Hebrews, you cannot separate this system up. It is the Mosaic Covenant. It is the law in its entirety, including the Ten Commandments, the 635 ceremonial commandments, all the sacrifices, all the ceremonies, the priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, the sons of Levi, the Passover, the Day of Atonement, all of it, the whole system. None of it saved anybody. You realize that? Not one soul that ever went to heaven went to heaven based on anything performed in any of those, both the temple or the tabernacle. If all they saw was, that's what happened with national Israel. That, that became the most important thing. That pointed somewhere else, but they didn't see what it pointed to. Their eyes were blinded. And see, in these verses, Paul compares the nation Israel under that old covenant with the church in the new covenant to prove that that Mosaic law and everything involved in it was temporary and pointed those who were under it to the same promise of salvation conditioned on the God-appointed Christ, the Messiah, based on his righteousness imputed. You say, them Old Testament saints didn't know that. Baloney! You think we just came up with imputed righteousness in the 1900s? King David, what did he say? Blessed is he whose sins are forgiven. Blessed is the man that, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's Old Testament. That ain't New Testament. Tell me them people didn't know something. Because why? They were taught of God. Just like you're taught of God. If we know anything, we don't. What do you have that you didn't receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as if you didn't receive it? God gave it to you. Listen, it, this is not my ability to teach somebody. Now, I thank God it's not my ability to teach somebody. You know yourself how... how unbelievably gracious it is when God opens your mind and your understanding and gives you eyes to see what you have missed your entire life. It's an amazing thing. Every one of us have said, how could I have missed that? We were dead. What can a dead man do? 
Dead men can't see, they can't walk, they can't talk, they can't think, they can't do anything. They're necros. That's what that word dead means. What does that mean? Graveyard dead. As dead as you can be. But all of it pointed them to the Messiah without the deeds of the law. The nation Israel's participation in that old covenant, it didn't save them. It didn't make them more holy. It didn't recommend them to God in an eternal sense. The things in and of themselves did not, none of those things remove God's wrath or gain God's wrath or gain God's favor eternally. Why? How do we know it didn't? Because they had to offer another one and another one and another one. How long? Until the time of Reformation. And I'm not talking about when uh, Luther nailed it in treatises on the Catholic Church. Talking about the time of Reformation when Christ came. That's what old Simeon was looking for. I've seen God's Christ. I've seen the Messiah. All of those things contributed nothing to the eternal salvation and final glory of any sinner who was in bondage to them and followed them. Folks, the only eternal value they had was as they pointed sinners as a tutor, as a schoolmaster, what did it do? It pointed them to Christ and salvation conditioned on him. The long and the short of it is this. Salvation has always been by promise. All the way back to our first parents that fell in the Garden of Eden. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between Satan and the woman, between thy seed, and her seed. It, her seed, the seed of the woman, what will it do? It will bruise thy head and you'll bruise his heel. That's the first promise of somebody taking our place. Accomplishing salvation on our behalf. And to illustrate this, Paul presents a case of an heir during childhood. Now you got to keep an heir. An heir, what does an heir involve? What does his heir tell us? It means you got an inheritance that's, that's yours, right? And the heir is, even though he's young, my, my two boys, right now, along with my wife, because the state of Louisiana is a little different. <laughs> if you're a community property state, you can't, it, it doesn't work this way. But it does work this way, but this is, it's in what we're talking about, the way he's talking about it. Who inherits what, what's mine and hers? Well, just take it. When we take me and mom out of the way, who gets it? Those two boys. In reality, according to this illustration, it's already theirs. What are they waiting for? I hope they're not sitting there counting the day. When mom and dad die, we get everything they got. We're going to burn it all up, boys. We're going to go through it. I ain't going to leave y'all nothing. But that, that, it's theirs. It belongs to there, and that's what he's saying here. Even though he's a young child, it's, it could be a baby. Everything that belongs to mom and dad, ultimately, who's it going to belong to? To that heir, to that child, all of it. And here's the thing. How's it his? By promise and by will. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a will and testament. And he's fully entitled to the whole inheritance, yet while he's a child, while he's underage, he is kept under certain restraints, kept in school, he's taught, he's corrected as if he was a servant and not an heir. He's not treated like he's Lord of all, even though he is Lord of all. Right? Now get this picture in your mind. But here's the thing. The father appointed a time for the inheritance to come into effect. Which shows what? That it was temporary. Because if there's a time appointed to the father for it to come to a close, it's saying what? It's not eternal in nature. What's going on here? And so he's showing what? That whole economy, that whole system, including the law, the Ten Commandments, <laughs> was temporary you think about that in light of what Paul the writer of Hebrews wrote in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15 through 17 about a will he says and for this cause 
He is mediator of the new testament, the new will, the new covenant. That by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first will, they which are called might receive what? The promise. The promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, where a will is, now listen to this name, where a will is, there must also of necessity be what? The death of the one who wrote, whose will has been written, the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it's of no strength at all why the testator, you can't, they, your, your heir can't come to you demand what's yours until you die. Period. The possession of the inheritance, it doesn't rest on anything done by the heir. It rests exclusively on what? The death of the testator. And these Judaizers, these Jews that are trying to convince these, these Gentiles that had believed the gospel to go back under the law, they didn't know that. And folks, here's the problem. They couldn't see that. They couldn't understand this truth. And Paul has set that forth more clearly. We get ne next week we come back in verse 4. Look at verse 3. Notice what he says next. Because he makes these words clear. He says, even so we, when we were children, he includes himself in this number. This is a, this is a scribe and a Pharisee, a teacher and leader, a former teacher and leader among Israel. He said, even we... So we, when we were children, what? We were in bondage. And notice how he refers to it. We're the elements of the world. And I'd have you to notice Paul uses the personal pronoun we twice in this sentence. Proving that he's speaking of who? He's talking about national Israel. Under that old covenant. Even so, national Israel under the old covenant, which represents the church in its infancy, because listen, national Israel within that, where was the church of God existed? Because there's only been, how many brides are there? There's one. It's not two. There's not a Jewish bride and a Gentile bride. There's one church. Right? There's one foe, Christ, and what Christ said, there are other sheep I have which are not of this foe, they're not a national Israel, them also I must bring, and there be what? One foe. In Ephesians chapter 2, he said he's broken down the middle wall of par partition, making of both one. Same church back then, same church today. No difference. And here's the thing, under that infancy state of the church, in national Israel, they were kept like children in a school. And like heirs who had not yet come of age, they were under ceremonies and sacrifices and the rituals of that old Mosaic law. And how does Paul refer to all of those things? He calls them elements, which literally means elemental things. Meaning what? They're of the world earthy. They consisted of outward, worldly, and earthly things such as what? Animal sacrifices, ceremonies, washings, days, meats, which could never take away sin. All of it. Now who ordained all these things? God did. God gave them the instruction. What were they given to them for? They were given to them to point them where? To the one that they were hoping for. The Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. For all of their salvation. And you've got to understand this. And I want to make this as clear. If you don't get anything else from me this morning, I pray that you get this. Every true believer in that nation, in national Israel, every true believer... They knew and they understood the spiritual and eternal meaning of those elements. Every one of them. And they sought and they found eternal salvation the same way you and I did. How? By promise. Listen to you. These all died in faith. 
not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that what? Just like you and me, we're strangers and we're pilgrims down here. This is not our home, nor what is there. Listen, get it. This is the one that blew me away. I got thinking about this this way. King David, king of Israel, a man called twice in the scriptures, a man after God's own heart, called the apple of God's eye. King David. King David himself, he was under the tutor. He was under the governors of that old mosaic economy. Just like every other elect center in national Israel. But their hope, David's hope, and all those elect believing Jews in national Israel, their hope was not in their law nor in their obedience to the law. Where was their hope? Their hope was in the promise. And their hope was in the God who made the promise. King David, when he was about to die, says, Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel, said, What do you say, David? The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spake to me. What did he tell him? He that rules over men must be just. Ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth. Even a morning without clouds. As the tender grass springeth out of the earth by the clear shining after rain. That's what a king's supposed to be. I don't know but one king that's ever been that. The king of righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what David's about to admit. He said, although my house be not so. <laughs> he, had, he hadn't ruled in justice. God told him what? Don't, um, don't number Israel. Don't you put your trust in horses or men. What did he do? Unjustly, he didn't believe, didn't take God at his word. He lusted after another man's wife. Is that serving justly? Demanding the people that know the law says thou shalt not commit adultery and what does he himself do? He says, although my house be not so with God, here's his hope. Yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant. What? What kind of covenant? An everlasting covenant. Ordered in all things. How can it be ordered in all things, you say? Our God is in the heavens. He doeth according to his will among the armies of heaven, among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand, or none can say unto him, What doest thou? Ordered in all things, and sure. This is all my hope. This is all my salvation. This is all my desire. Although he make it not to grow. In other words, even though I don't see it in my life, it does not change the covenant. Folks, we've got to get our eyes off of ourselves. We said it in the Sunday Bible class there. We're to be looking to where? Looking unto Christ. Ever and always. Paul used this word bondage as it relates to these believing Jews. And he includes himself in it. He said even so we were in bondage to the elements. And it's important. When he wrote we were in bondage, that word were we were in bondage. It's in the past tense. It's really in what's called the imperfect tense, which means a continual, repeated action in the past. Not something that's going on now. It's a repeated, occurring action in the past. And that word bondage means to make a slave or to be reduced to bondage. And he says, what were? We were in bondage. We are in bondage. Little translation of this verse, so also we, when we were babes, under the elements of the world, were in servitude. And they did. And folks, that's all the law can do. All the law can do is demand what? Perfection. 
And when it finds the least failure to its perfect demands, the only thing that it can do is pronounce the just judgment. The wages of sin, death. You break it, you're done. I'm telling you. You that would desire to be under the law, don't you hear what the law says? Take that to heart. The way Paul used this word bondage in relation to these believing Jews under that old covenant, it doesn't mean a bondage of legalism. That's not what he's talking about. Which is when a sinner seeks and expects salvation and final glorification based on something other than the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. This bondage, the way he uses it here, refers to the simple fact that all the rules and all the regulations of the old covenant were binding on all those in national Israel, both believing Jew and unbelieving Jew. You say, if, how could it be binding on the unbelieving Jew? I tell you this: when they, when the unbelieving Jew even though he might not, he was still a Jew. When he violated that law, what happened to him? Make no difference with him. And if it would have been a believing Jew, you violate that law, what were they? There were consequences to it. Now, there were. These, these unbelieving Jews were legalists because of their perversion of the elements. They sought salvation and final glory not by promise, but based on their obedience, their participation in these things that were in force until the time appointed of the Father. But even the believing Jews in national Israel, they were bound to those elements. The difference was this. Those elect believing Jews, they looked through these elements. Seeing the promise and the one who made the promise. Listen to King David again. Blessed is the man, or blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is a man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and whose spirit is no guile. <laughs> Think about that. Could that be me? I. I'm godless. Remember, remember what he said to Nathaniel when he found him out of a tree? He said, a, a, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. And yet that man who was with no guile at the end, what did he do when Christ, they took our Lord away? <laughs> Gone just like everybody else. That's some guile there. But he says that these are blessed. Why? Why is that? There's no guile. For the day and night, Thy hand was heavy upon me. It's King David. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer, Salah. I acknowledge my sin unto thee. And I and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. What pointed that out to him? That old covenant. That law. And folks, here's the thing. That law of Moses was not David's enemy. It was his schoolmaster that continually drove him where? To Christ. To the promised Messiah. Drove all God's elect to it. And this was in force until, what does it say in our text? The time appointed of the Father. A specific time. But here's a sad reality, and we'll close with this this morning. In spite of the fact that God sent Christ here to fulfill the law, to magnify the law and make it honorable, in spite of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ satisfied every jot and every tittle of that law, these Judaizers, what were they seeking to do? They were seeking to put these believing Gentiles back under the law for justification because they said, except you be, just, except you be circumcised after the law of Moses... You cannot be saved. And it's the same today. Lost, religious, sincere, self-righteous sinners claim that salvation and justification is found in Christ alone. Do they not? Every, every religion I know, they see salvation is through and by Christ. And they encourage your hearers to do what? Come to Christ. Come to the Christ that, that we've invented. 
that we've imagined a Christ that didn't actually put away sin. He made the putting away of sin possible if you'll fulfill whatever conditions are laid upon you. And then they turn right around after telling people salvation's by grace and they put themselves and their hearers, where do they put them at? They bind on them burdens that they themselves wouldn't lift one finger to carry. And put them back under the law and say, well, we're saved by Christ's blood and his righteousness, but we're sanctified and made holy and we're kept by our obedience and our morality and our perseverance. And Paul says what? No, 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 no. Justification, righteousness comes one way, through Christ alone, by God-given faith alone, and not by the works of the law. And boy, he comes back in verse 4 where we'll start next week and he lays this thing wide open now. So you come back and you join us next week. Let's stand together. We'll be dismissed. I appreciate your presence. Lord bless you. Keep you till we see you next Lord's Day. Donald, if you would, dismiss us, please, sir.